Hello and welcome from Mexico City to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where I have conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those with some connection to Latin America. This episode is brought to you by LatemList.com. If you like this podcast, you'll enjoy LatemList's daily tech news reporting. Sign up for the mailing list to get the weekly email update. My guest today is Mariana Costa Checa, the Peruvian co founder and CEO of Laboratoria, a social impact nonprofit that runs programming boot camps for women in Lima, Santiago, Mexico City, Guadalajara, and Sao Paulo, and then places them in jobs at an over 85% success rate. We talk about how Mariana decided she wanted to get involved in tech after seeing some weird code on a black screen, as she put it, her previous jobs in the social impact sector, and how she was on a panel in Silicon Valley flanked by Barack Obama and Mark Zuckerberg to talk about her work. We also cover Mariana's advice for companies for hiring more women in tech, building a nonprofit in Latin America, and Laboratoria's expansion plans across Latin America over the next year. Mariana went above and beyond this podcast, including a third guest, recording while having her two-week-old baby on her lap. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Mariana Costa Checa. Hey, Mariana, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being willing to do it. Hi, thank you for the invitation. No, of course. So where are you in the world today? I'm in Lima, Peru. It's it's winter here and it's pretty gray, but it's still nice. It's pretty gray in Lima in summer too, isn't it? No, actually, you know, there's there's sun over in in summer. Yeah, people always say that, but actually summer is beautiful. (laughs) That's my, my... my endless discussion with my friends, they're like, oh, Lima is great all year, all year round. But no, summer is so nice. I think I need to come in summer then, because I think I've been to Lima about five times, and I think I've seen the sun once. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come down between December and April, then, then you'll, you'll have better chances. But the food more than makes up for it, so it's okay. Yeah, totally, totally. So tell me a little bit about Laboratoria. What are you up to? Yes, so we're actually going to turn five years this year. So it's exciting times. Uh, we continue growing and, 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 and making our bootcamp better every time. No? So we run a bootcamp that, that serves only women and, and it also focuses on women who haven't been able to access quality higher education yet and therefore start a good career that makes them feel fulfilled and where they can grow. And so that, that's actually going really well. It's changed a lot over the years and it's grown. We started in Lima and now we have five training centers. So we're in Lima, Santiago, Mexico City, Guadalajara, and Sao Paulo. And, and it's in a process of really continuous improvement, no? of, of being as close as, as we can be to the work environment and preparing our students with the best tools, not only technical, but also life skills for them to succeed at, at, at work. And, and then on the other hand, now we're also quite focused on working with companies. That's something that started only around two years ago when we realized that one end of the equation was bringing diverse talent to the tech sector, but then the other was also having an impact on how do we change that work environment so that that talent has the best opportunities to grow and to lead, you know? So we started a program to, to train companies too in digital and cultural transformation so that they can actually continue investing in technology, continue growing their teams, but do so with a lens of diversity and inclusion that can actually make the whole digital economy in Latin America not only bigger and better, but a source of opportunity for more people. So can you set the stage a little bit for what's it like in Latin America and why this is so important? I mean, people have heard about maybe some of the newer boot camps that have started in the U.S. and there's been lots of different inclusion programs in the U.S. You started five years before most or at least three, four years before most of the ones in the U.S. got started. Why was this such a big problem and and what's the what was the environment like in Latin America when you were just getting started? Yeah, I I always think about that because I I think we were really lucky to bump into, into this opportunity a little bit ahead of time, but not too much. I think we were like at the beginning of the wave and that has been amazing. Um, so actually, it was back in 2013. My, I, I was living in the U.S. with my husband, and then I was doing a master's degree, and a really good friend of mine from, from the program was moving to Peru, and we had decided, my husband and I, to move, to move back to Peru, too. Uh, so the three of us started, started talking and saying, okay, what can we do together in Peru? And we decided that it, it could be a good opportunity to become entrepreneurs. No? We actually had absolutely no idea what we would do, but my husband uh, used to be a programmer. Uh, so we said, okay, we can do something in technology. 
Uh, my, my other friend, Rodolfo, and I were doing a master's in, in, in public administration and development. So we said, let's try and find something that has a social impact. After lots of failed ideas uh, and wasting a lot of time, we ended up starting a, a software development company. So we started doing uh, websites and applications for big companies in Lima. The market was growing at the time. It was relatively easy to find clients. And we had to, to start growing our own team of developers. No? And, and that's when we realized, okay, it's actually really hard to find good software developers in Lima. And it's almost impossible to find any women. You know, our team started growing. We were five, we were 10, we were 15. And at a point, it was only me and a graphic designer and, and the rest of the team were all guys. And I think I, I think I had the advantage of being an outsider to the world of tech. Because for me, that was actually pretty strange. I was like, what, what, what's going on? What, why is this the case? And, and everybody on the team was like, oh, you know, this is how it's always been. You know, this is how our previous jobs were. This is how, uh, if they went to college, this is how college was. So, so, but for me, it kind of, I don't know, it, it just didn't sound well, you know? So we, I, we decided to, to, to see if we could somehow fix the problem. Initially, we said, okay, let's go out and see if we can find women anywhere else. And if not, let's train women ourselves, you know? We also realized that, that really software development was one of the few spaces where companies weren't as strict in terms of uh, requiring candidates to have a, a university degree. And, and in Latin America, this is actually quite unique because we're still a relatively conservative region in many ways. And usually the only way to have a good career is to have a, a degree from a good university. No? So there was like a loophole in the system here. So we went out and, and we started running a, a small pilot that, that later became laboratory. We ended up closing down the other company and everything. But but yeah, I think we were really lucky because we literally bumped into the problem because we had this, this, this software company before. And then as soon as we started getting involved into education and learning and, and, and all of that, we, we kind of fell in love with that opportunity. So on your website, there's a picture of you flanked by Barack Obama and Mark Zuckerberg with an Obama quote saying that the percentage of successful people that have gone through laboratory is extraordinary. How did that happen? And what, what is the, the success rate of people that go through it? Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really good story. <laughs> uh, so how did that happen? Also, I think we've been so lucky along the journey. I, there, there were, this was the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. And we were going, we were going to participate there. Actually, I wasn't going to be there because I, ha I have two, two kids. Uh, so my, my, my three-year-old now was born around like two weeks before the summit. And I had basically said, I cannot make it. My, one of my partners is going to go. And then like maybe three weeks before the summit, I received a call from someone from the, from the government. No? Someone from an accelerator we had taken part in contacted me and said, Mariana, there is someone from the State Department that wants to get in touch with you. I was like, what? The State Department, you know, I lived in the U.S. I was like, maybe I left something there that I shouldn't have. <laughs> then they reached out to me and, and, and this woman said, you know, we know that you, you said you cannot make it to the summit, but we wanted to, to, to share that we want to invite you to a panel with President Obama and Mark Zuckerberg to see if you could reconsider your decision. So I was like, with who? <laughs> um, and she explained a little bit more about the idea of the panel and the opportunity and and yeah, and basically said that if I could co confirm as soon as possible. So, so yeah, I said, okay, I'll go. I'll see how it goes with my, with my newer baby, but I'll, 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 I have to make it. No, it's such a great opportunity. Thankfully, things went well. Uh, it was still a very hard trip for me because I had a, yeah, like two and a half week old then, but I like literally went and came back, but it was an amazing opportunity. And, and I mean, I, I still have to like, there's some things that have happened along the way, Laboratoria, that I still have to pinch myself and say, okay, this was real and it happened. No? And I think that that is one of those because it gave us, it gave us a lot of recognition. In, it made the program very well known in, in the countries where we were working. The media gave a lot of attention to it. So like thousands and thousands of women and companies learned about our work through that experience. And, and obviously it was a, a pleasure and a highlight to meet someone like, like Obama. So, so yeah, it was really, really nice. And what's been the success rates for people that have gone through the program? Yes. So, okay, back then I remember he said like 65% and I said, no, it's actually 70%. <laughs> um, and, and I think, uh, and he made a joke about, about correcting him now that he had all data. Uh, but we've continuously focused on improving that number. And actually now we're very, very proud. Like we have, it, it varies a little bit cohort by cohort, but our goal is to always be above 85%. 
and we've had some cohorts where we've had like 97% placement rate. Uh, now consistently, we, we, I mean, it's rare that we'll have a, co a cohort below 80%. Um, so consistently, I would say on, on average, we're around 85, 90%. Uh, and in some cases, it's been amazing. We've managed to place all our students, but one maybe. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that uh, along the years, we've focused a lot in really fine tuning the program and, and everything about the program, you know, like how the students learn. It's all project based now. So how do we engage companies in, in, in crafting those projects? How do we really, really understand how to build these life skills that are so critical in the end? And we've also done a, a, a huge job to better understand the hiring companies. No, at the beginning we were all focused on the students. Then some way, some sometime along the way, we said, okay, we actually need to understand the companies really well. What are their hire, their hiring processes? Who takes part in that decision? Uh, and how do we prepare students to better fit that world? And 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 I think that in Latin America we have a context that that. Uh, that's that's quite unique because those hiring companies look very different. It's it's not like all our students are going to work in fast growing tech startups. No, I mean there some of them are, but many of them are going to work actually in banks, in government, in insurance, in in media companies, in digital agencies, in software factories, in small family companies. So there's like a wide range of employers. Um, and, and I think we've done a good job in really understanding what their pains are and in developing a, a program that responds to those things uh, along the funnel, no? from how we identify our students to how they learn, to how they, we run the placement process, to how we follow up with them. And we, we like grow, build and grow our alumni community, engaging the companies too. Um, so I think that really has enabled us to, to improve significantly along the way. You know, if, if you also see, for example, that the starting salary of our graduates has more than doubled since we started. You know? uh, and I think that's also a reflection of that mindset of continuous improvement. Did you always know that you wanted to be involved in tech or was this something that came up in your career path? Uh, no, it completely came up. I've actually reflected a lot on that because uh, I'm a woman and... and I actually, I come from a family of all women. I have only sisters and so, and I never considered a career in technology. Like it never even crossed my mind when I was thinking, what did I want to study? And I actually like sciences, but it just never, never was an option. No, and, and I think that I, I only came to, to, to know the world of technology through Herman uh, when we started dating and he was a programmer. That was the first time I saw like a black screen with code and I kind of understood, okay, actually this is, this is pretty cool. And I think that's because that's because it's one of the reasons of why we have so few women in tech, no? Because of all the stereotypes around it. I even remember when when I started college here in Peru, there were like two faculties, no? The 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 humanities one and then the sciences one. And I mean, there were all these jokes about how all the weird people were in the sciences one, you know, and all the all the cooler people were in the humanities one, and that was like a given. So so yeah, I think I grew up. Uh, with that behind me too, unfortunately. Um, and it wasn't until later in life that I had the opportunity to discover this other world and then to try and work to make sure that that's not the case anymore. You know? And I think one of the most amazing things with Laboratoria for me has been to see how our students actually love love what they do, you know? Not 100% of them, of course. There's some students that join and they're like, okay, this is, it gives me a great job, but I don't know if it's my life thing. But actually for the vast majority of them, I mean, they, they just, they fall in love with it and they feel so empowered by being able to build things that they can then show to the world. So yeah, so that has been, it didn't happen for me, but, but at least it's happening for thousands of other women now. What did you do before you saw that weird screen of code? What kind of projects and companies and things were you working on? I, I always worked in, in social impact. I, I worked before for a multilateral organization in development projects in, in Central America and the Caribbean. Then I worked for a, for a non-profit uh, that also had development projects throughout Latin America. So I was always working in, in, in areas related to how, how can we improve economic opportunity for underserved people or, uh, and so on. And, and that's, that's what I always like. Uh, I think I've, I've been really lucky throughout my life here and, and obviously growing up, I think in Latin America, when I grew up, you know, I grew up in the 80s and 90s in Peru, which was a very difficult social political situation. And I, I was lucky to have good opportunities. So, so I always knew I somehow wanted to orient my career to, to create those better, so better opportunities overall. Um, 
So that's why I now feel so, so, so happy and so privileged that, that I have laboratory in my life because I think it was an amazing way to, to mix these two worlds, no? a world of technology and opportunity and innovation and like creation and, 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 and so many exciting things with actually providing a better path no? and, and, and the possibility of a better future for thousands of amazing women that have all the talent, all the potential, but that due to the social structures that we have here, haven't been able yet to pursue those opportunities. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, the most fulfilling part for, for me and I think for everyone that's, that's behind our organization. What were some of the biggest lessons you learned working in the social impact sector that you now use in Laboratory of Today? Yeah, eh, you know, there's, there's, there's things both ways. Sometimes I think, you know, this learning was really va- has been really valuable for me. Some other times I think we've learned so much at Laboratoria that could do so much good for the more traditional social impact sector, no? In terms of things that I learned before, my, my, my longest job, I was working at this multilateral for four years and I was traveling a lot. I had a great boss, he was a great mentor and he always pushed me to say, oh, you, you, you won't do any development from, from Washington DC, you know, that's where I was based. You need to be wherever our work and empathy. So you need to be in this indigenous community in Guatemala or you need to be in, in Haiti or you need to be working in this community in Salvador. And I spent, I spent a lot of my time um, in those contexts and I think I, I really learned how, how you need to be so sensitive and so empathic you know not to think that oh because I come from the from the big organization I know what 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 you need and your solution no you know you need to come really like with a, an open mind to be able to put yourself in the situation of those people and, and really only from that standpoint better understand how to serve them um, and I think that's something that that we've tried to build in Laboratoria since the beginning you know and and it's not easy because you often feel that you know how it needs to be done, but we're always like, we need to go back to our students, you know, and understand them in their entire context. And that really, really, I think, sets a, a, a lens to, to build a program that responds to their specific needs. And, and that's what we, we've had to do. And then on the other side, I think we've also, at Laboratoria, it's been amazing to, to build an organization that has a culture that really moves fast, you know, where we're always learning where we have this mindset of continuous improvement, um, always challenge you, challenge you, challenging you to do better. And I think that type of speed is what the more traditional development sector often needs. No? So I think it's this mix of startup with social impact that, that I really love and I hope to see more of. When you were just starting Laboratoria, what were the first couple of steps that you did to make sure that there was a market and get it off the ground? Yeah, so we were really lean. I mean, that, that, that's something I'm very glad. <laughs> the previous things that we tried to start, we weren't. I think we learned the lesson. So in Laboratorio at the beginning, we just ran a pilot with 15 students, but we started talking about it. And it was amazing to see all the interest that, that it sparked. So I had like all these companies reaching out and saying, I love what you're doing. I need developers. I would love if they were women. So really, I mean, I think we were lean to validate things. We have no, no money at the point to run this. It was a really like low cost pilot, uh, but, but it enabled us to validate that, that there was interest on, on the company side, that there were, that our students loved to learn actually, and that this could be something big, no? And since then, I think we've been, we've had a, we've been, had a good mix of being aggressive in some things and being cautious in others, no? So for example, and we've learned from our mistakes, no? At, at some point along the way, for example, we said, oh, you know, we need to grow way faster. We need to go from training 100 students a year to training 200 of them. And we kind of started growing too fast. And then we realized, you know, if we keep this pace, we're not going to be able to place them in the best jobs because there just aren't enough of those jobs at this moment in the markets where we're working. So we need to be a bit more cautious and we need to better understand the market and not also better understand the market, but maybe we can play a part in helping grow that market too. And that's when we started our work with companies, you know, where we said, okay, how do we actually play a role in, in, in helping these companies uh, better understand why investing in digital is so important, you know, what the type of impact it can have in their business why certain to actually build their own software too is actually a, a key step for them to remain competitive you know, and, and do that in a certain way. So, so I think that being close to that market, you know, to understanding the growth of, of, of demand for tech jobs in our, in our markets and actually playing an active role in growing that has been, has been the best strategy for us. How did you think about international expansion? 
Yeah, international expansion. Uh, one thing that, uh, more I'm going to say about the previous thing. Yeah, I think that at, at some point we were a victim. You know, we're based in Latin America, but we go quite often to the U.S. and we go a lot to Silicon Valley. And, and I think at some point we kind of got this bag that, oh, either you grow exponentially and reach thousands and millions of people or you're nothing. No, I actually, I remember we applied to YC at a point and the feedback was like, no, you know, you, you need to grow like a hundred times more. And we kind of got contaminated by that thing of, oh, you know, if we're just training a thousand women a year, that's just not enough. And, and I think a huge lesson for me has been that makes absolutely no sense. You know, it depends. Where are you? What are you doing? And in our case, the impact of every student that goes through Laboratoria is super transformational. Uh, yeah, we're never going to reach a million, a million women because there's no need for a million developers right now in, in the region. But those that go through the program not only have a profound impact in their lives and their future, but collectively, they're changing an entire industry. You know? So if you see how the, how the tech sector looks today in Lima or, or in Santiago, I mean, Laboratoria has marked a huge path, a before and after, and I, I'm pretty sure we will have a profound impact in the future of how the tech sector looks in this market. So, so for me, that's where, that's where the transformation happens. Okay, now about international expansion. <laughs> I mean, being super honest, super honest, I think at the, at the beginning we were very reckless. Uh, we started in Lima, we were loving what we were doing, and then two of my best friends from grad school were like, oh, this is amazing, you know, we should bring it to Chile and to Mexico. They were in Chile and in Mexico, respectively. And I was always like, yeah, we definitely should. And then one day they were like, you know what, I don't like my job anymore. Why don't we try and, 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 and pilot this and see if what's happening in Lima could happen here too. Uh, and I said, yes, let's do that, just because they were really, really close friends of mine that I fully, fully trusted. Uh, and that's what we did. So it was really rudimentary, the scale at the beginning. Um, and it brought some problems that we've later <laughs> had to invest a lot of time fixing. But I think looking back, it was a good decision because the program, I mean, overall, Laboratoria grew with a presence in multiple markets already. And I think that's enriched it significantly. And I think uh, it really pushed our boundaries in terms of how do we make sure we sustain the quality of that we do in different locations, how do we make sure we build the same organizational culture in different locations? And that has been a, a core focus for us since the beginning, thanks to that early stage scale. No? Since, obviously, we've become a bit more and more, I mean, we've learned. So our two other cities, we then opened Guadalajara. That was much more strategic. You know, this is a tech hub. There's demand. Let's go out. Let's, let's try and do this step by step. We then opened Brazil. We have a partner in Brazil. They reached out to us and... and we just thought it was a great opportunity and they were great partners to have. Uh, and we've been able to support those scale-ups much better. We're actually opening in Colombia next year. That also has been a more strategic decision of this is a market where we should be. Let's go out and raise the money to try and make it happen. Um, so, yeah, it's been a mix and definitely not a textbook type of scale, but, but it's worked for us. We've made it work. So you mentioned raising the money to do Colombia. How, how have you funded this throughout the, its growth? Yeah, so we are actually, we're a non-profit. Uh, that's a decision we took uh, at the beginning because it would have been honestly impossible to raise any funding as a for-profit company um, in, with, with our business model at the time. We had no idea how it was, this would ever become sustainable. No? Um, and we also wanted to make sure that our, our main driver was always the impact of the program. But in the beginning, we knew that we had to, to become self-sustaining too, you know, that our, our means of funding to start would be philanthropy, but that we would have to find a way to really sustain this in the long run. So we've been really lucky. We've had amazing partners. Everything we've done until now, we funded in our first two years with philanthropy. Now our own earned revenue is significantly a more important part of our overall revenue, and that's really good. But still, I mean, philanthropic partners have been a major, major... Uh, I mean, a major positive thing, thing in our journey, you know, and I think we've managed to, 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 to get partners that are with us, not only, I mean, not only financially, you know, but where we actually contribute, uh, where they actually get to contribute to our work in a much more significant way. So, for example, something good is that we've built, many of our, of our founders right now are actually in this space, you know, they're, they're, they're technology companies like, like Google or, or like Microsoft that, that not only support us financially, as I was saying, but that also get involved in, in several other parts of our work, you know, from, from mentoring our students to doing code review 
to coming down to work on a spring design on how can we improve our learning management system uh, or how can we review our curricula and things like that. So, so that has been really, really positive. And then I think another important learning is that most of our philanthropic funding has come from, from the U.S. Some of it has come from Latin America, but I feel like I, I, I've also had that realization that unfortunately, philanthropy is still quite small in, in, in Latin America, no? Uh, and, and, and yeah, that's why we, we at some point decided, why don't we explore the U.S. as a source of funding? And I think that was a really good decision. So we, we have funding from many organizations that are U.S.-based, but that do work here, no? And therefore have an interest in, in contributing to the growth of the region here too. But, but as I was saying, not now... Like this year, for example, last year, we covered around a third of our costs from our own earned revenue. So that's already a, a significant change from, from where we started, no? And, and this year, that should be even more and so on. So we now do have a business model that hopefully will continue to work. And, and hopefully, like, I think in the short, in the next four or five years, we should become a self-sustaining organization that doesn't rely anymore on, on, on external funding. No? And that's also what our funders want, of course. So, so yeah, that's a big focus for us now too. What strategies should tech companies be using to hire more women in tech? Well, there's a bunch and, and, and we spend a lot of time discussing them with companies. I think that the, that the first thing is think about where they're recruiting for, from and open their, their minds, you know, and their policies. So, if they continue to recruit from a certain, I don't know, three or four good universities where 95% of the student body is male, then that's not going to happen. No, it's not going to change anything. So first of all, I mean, make an additional effort to go out to places like Laboratoria or places that, 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 that have done an effort to serve more women and include them in their, in their pipeline eh, so that they can have a more diversity in the pipeline to begin with. Um, then I think there's a lot to change. I mean, there's some, there's, then the next step would be, okay, now certain processes within the company. So, for example, we've worked with many companies to try and change this prerequisite of needing a higher education degree for a certain type of job. Uh, many of them just by default, you know, if you're above this certain pay level, you must have a, a university degree. And, and it's been actually great to see the willingness of many companies to question that and to say, they, they're usually like, at the beginning, they're like, oh, no, I'm sorry, I can't hire from laboratory because they don't have a degree. Then, you know, we engage them, they come to our talent fest, they get to know the program and they're like, you know what, they interview students, they're like, I'm going to make a, an exception. And then hopefully that exception will become the norm, you know, that's the one a priority for us. And then I think there's another huge area of work once our students join those companies, you know, how do they build a, a culture that's actually inclusive? Uh, where even if you're the only women in a team of 20 guys, you have the same opportunity to thrive and grow. Uh, and, and that is, is a core area of our work right now, too, you know, because I think that's where we, we face more challenges. Uh, I mean, luckily, I think that a, a huge number of our, like our, many of our hiring companies rehire, right? So the, the students that had the toughest journey were our first cohort because literally then most of them were the only women in a team of X number of guys. Now, most companies already have laboratory graduates, and I think that's making things a little bit easier. Um, but there's still a lot to do in terms of how do they provide training to, the, to their HR and, and tech teams uh, so that they actually understand that sometimes some practices are not inclusive at, at all, even if people don't realize that's the case. You know? So yeah, one, one thing that we want to prioritize over the next two years, for example, is we, we're, we're trying to build these communities of practice with hiring companies around diversity and inclusion to get the companies to 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 make specific commitments to diversity and, and, and to inclusion, you know, and to support them along the way. That, that's something that in, in the U.S. is happening already, but in Latin America, I, we're far from there. You know, the conversation about diversity and inclusion is very early stage still. And for many companies, many, many big companies, that <laughs> they're like, why would, I mean, I, I just want the talent, you know, I don't mind if it's men or women. I, I don't discriminate them. <laughs> without realizing that it's actually quite the opposite, no? that sometimes if they don't make a specific effort to build a more diverse team, the default will be what they've had and, and that there's so many good reasons to try and change that. If you could go back to when you were just starting Laboratoria, knowing everything you know today, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, man, I think I would say, 
I think that, that that I would say be, be prepared to, to what's coming ahead. It's it's gonna be way more way more uh, intense, but also good that 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 I could have ever imagined. I think it, I I would also say you know always have your space to have perspective. It, it's easy when you're trying to run and grow a company and have an impact and become self-sustaining to get overwhelmed. And and I think having perspective, you know, having the, the, the opportunity to look back and look at things as they really are, you know, not, not as they seem in those moments of stress, it's, it's super, super important. And then, you know what, I, I actually think we've done many things right and, and I feel, feel very proud of that. So I would just say, be confident, you know, that the decision that you're taking, yeah, you'll make mistakes, but really most of the time, if you, if you think about them, if you're transparent, if you're honest, if you have good intentions and make sure that your actions respond to that, you're going to do well. I think there's a lot of insecurity along the way of building and growing a company, you know, and, and, and often I think if you're a good, talented person, if you build a really good team, surround yourself with the right people, uh, then things, things actually can, can work. What books, blogs, podcasts, documentaries do you like to recommend to people, whether about startups in general or just life? Yeah. So, when people are starting a company and, and they, they come to, to us for advice, I always send them to the Lean Startup. I think that it saves us a lot of time. It's something that's relatively simple, but if you've never built a company or, or, or a product, it's actually very hard to know how to start. You know? so, so I always send them that way uh, as, as a good starting point. More recently, yeah, I love to le- read and hear and learn about other entrepreneurs. I think it's so insightful. So I follow many podcasts that share the story of, of other entrepreneurs, you know, from Masters of Scale to how I built this, because I think that there's so much value in, in learning from the journey of others. And then, I mean, I think it's, it's also important to try and save time for, for things that are not necessarily work-related. You know, where, when everything revolves around work, I often find great insights about just life and, and, and humanity in, in, in spaces that have nothing to do with technology or, or social enterprise, no? in, in novels or, or in a few podcasts that I love. I love On Being, I love uh, Radio Ambulante, that, that really talk more about life and humanity and why we are the way we are and why we act the way we act. Because in the end, I think running a company, at least in our case, and I think in every case, you know, we are people trying to serve people. So I think that the human part in the equation is by far the most important part. So so anything that can lead and help me in, in terms of better understanding how we people are and what motivates us, I think it's really valuable. What's next for you and Laboratoria? Uh, what's next? So Laboratoria, we have this exciting plan to, to open in Colombia next year. I think that will be an important focus. Um, we want to launch a new track too. So now we have front-end development and UX design. We want to launch a back-end track. Hopefully also we're working for that too, so hopefully soon. I think we want to really continue never losing our focus on doing things better. No, on, 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 on. Even though we have been one of the first players in this wave of boot camps now, I think now we even have a bigger responsibility to do things well and, and to show others and, and hopefully collaborate with others no? to, to make sure that we sustain the quality of, of this type of, of, of educational alternatives. That's, that's like a, an important focus for us. No? Now we're thinking we have our direct impact, like our day-to-day is, is, is running. How, what, where's our systems level impact? And I think a, a huge part of that is in working with other players in, in our space now to make sure that we, that we collaborate and that we ensure certain standards that, that will help us all. So I think that's something else that we're going to be exploring over the next year or two. And for me, I think that uh, I still have some time uh, to continue strengthening and growing and, and, and leading Laboratoria. I think that I, I, there's a few more milestones that I would love to achieve as, as the CEO of the organization before I can say, okay, now maybe I'm ready to go to, to the next phase. No? So yeah, so I'll be focusing on that. I think that, that our working culture is super important. I think that making sure that all, we really have the best talent throughout that we are not only not only have a great product, but that we also have a great organization, you know, that can attract and provide opportunities for, for that talent. So yeah, for now, I think Laboratoria, as I always say, is, is my, my first baby, you know, and, and I think there's still a lot, a lot to do there. Well, it's an inspiring journey and story. Thanks for taking the time to share it with me. No, thank you, Nathan, for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure. 
Thanks again for listening to this episode of Crossing Borders with my guest, Mariana Costacheca, co-founder of Laboratoria. If you like this podcast, please share it with a friend and give us a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks to Angel Sofia and Josefina for helping produce this podcast and writing the show notes. Thanks to you for listening. Have a great rest of your day.